Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. For those who are Chinese, may I wish you a blessed and happy Chinese New Year. Many of our ancestors celebrated the Chinese New Year in the wrong way. They incorporated pagan customs or idolatrous practices in their celebration. But as believers, I don't see why we can't celebrate Chinese New Year in the right way. To celebrate in the name of the Lord and by giving thanks to Him for the prosperity He has given to us. When we eat together, when we visit relatives and friends and give gifts, we are showing Christian love. We are building bridges and sowing seeds for the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20, Paul said, To the Jew, I became a Jew, that I might win the Jews. To those under the law, I became those under the law, but I am not under the law, that I might win those under the law. Paul knew how to adapt himself to different cultures without compromising his faith so that he could win the people for Christ. And now I will lead us to say the opening prayer. Let's pray. O Lord our God, you are the God who made the world and everything in it. You don't live in temples which are built by human hands, nor are you served by human hands as if you needed anything. You are the one who gives us life and breath and everything else. From one man, you have made every nation of men that they should inhabit the earth, and you have determined the exact places where they should live. Lord, it is in you that we live and have our being. We pray that all men will seek you, reach out to you, and find you. Lord, we give you thanks for the numerous blessings you have given to us. In our work, study and business. All glory and praise be to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We will now have a time of worship. In one of Psalms, the writer said that our life has an important value or purpose, which is to praise the Lord. Psalms 115 verse 7 to 8. The dead cannot sing praises to the Lord, for they have gone into the silence of the grave. But we can praise the Lord, both now and forever. Praise the Lord. Greatest day in history Let his feet on you Embrace you be Sing it out Jesus is alive The empty cross The empty grave Love eternal You have won the day Shout it out Jesus is alive Is alive
the mountains fall and the seas will drown, but my word stays strong, says the Lord. When the time when the mountains fall and the seas turn dry but my heart says song says the Lord when the world gets the filled with broken hearts filled with broken hearts but my love Today, we have Pastor Tony Hospital to speak to us. 
He is a former BM missionary who has served in Kuching, Cebu and Miri. He is from Yorkshire, England. His dear wife, Evelyn, passed away about two years ago. She had been suffering cancer for a few years before she passed away. Her demise was a very difficult time for him. We are glad that Pastor Tony has recovered from his grief and has remarried. His wife is Jilly, a professional counsellor. We want to wish them every of God's blessing upon their marriage. Good. Well, it's uh, good to be with you today and have the opportunity to uh, share with you from a passage in the book of Ephesians. This is what is on my heart for today. And uh, it's uh, from Ephesians uh, chapter 3. And it's one of Paul's prayers. The Apostle Paul was a great man of prayer. And in Ephesians, we have two great prayers that were the burden of his heart for the churches which he had brought into being. Uh, there's one in chapter one, which is about having the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we can know Jesus better. And here in chapter three uh, is a prayer that we may be fully rooted and grounded in the love of God. So let me read these words and then we'll think about them uh, step by step. Ephesians chapter three and verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So that's the passage we're going to look at together this morning. And as I say, it's a passage about being rooted and grounded in love, and it is essentially a prayer. And uh, the first thing to notice is the way in which the Apostle Paul prays for the church at Ephesus to whom he is writing, this is what we might call a strategic prayer. Uh, it's a prayer which looks at the bigger picture, not the small detail, and looks at what is God's purpose and design for the church and for every individual believer, not just their day-to-day -day concerns. Now, often, of course, when we are praying, we are asking God to meet the needs of people. Uh, somebody's in hospital, we want them to get well. Somebody's taking an exam, we want them to have wisdom and to be able to do well. Somebody's thinking about getting married and we ask that God would guide and lead them and so on. Those are what we call the details of prayer, the day-to-day -day prayer. But sometimes we need to lift our sights a bit bigger, a bit higher, and to look at how can I pray for myself and for others more strategically. What does God really want for my life? And this is why Paul's prayer here is important. I want you to notice that he is praying for the church as a family and he's addressing God as Father. God is the Father of us all. And when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we're adopted into his family. We become brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, so Paul uh, prays this prayer to the Father from whom the whole family of believers in heaven and on earth derives its name. Uh, he's praying this family-wide prayer and he bows his knee before the Father because he comes in reverence and submission. He comes in awe and wonder to the God of the universe, but the God whom we call Father. And he opened his heart and he says, Father, this is what I want you to do for the church here in Ephesus. And it's a prayer that we can pray for ourselves and we can pray for our friends. We can pray for one another. Prayer is so important in the Christian life, isn't it? Uh, because it's through prayer that we connect with God. It's through prayer that God is able to work in our lives. And we need to learn how to pray strategically. 
So in this prayer, uh, Paul is asking for three important things. The first is that as believers, they may be empowered and know the power of God at work in their lives so they can deal with all the difficult circumstances that life brings to them. And then secondly, is praying that they may be established and that they may know this love of God deeply in their hearts. And then thirdly, he's praying that they may be filled, filled with all the fullness of God, so that there may be an overflow of the life of God from their very beings. Three strategic prayers which we want to pray today for ourselves and we want to pray for others. So let's uh, look at, first of all, at verse 16 and 17, this prayer that they may be empowered. This is what Paul says. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So Paul is coming to the heavenly father the Father who is rich beyond measure, the Father whose resources are limited. And when we come to him, we can make big petitions because there is no shortage in him. There is no insufficiency in God. God is able to meet our every need. And particularly out of those glorious riches, Paul is asking that they may know the power of God at work in them. And he prays for this in two different ways. First of all, he prays that they be, may be strengthened by the spirit in their inner being. Because the Holy Spirit has come to live within each one of us. These mortal bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. And at the moment of our conversion, that's what happens. A miracle takes place. The very life of God is given to us and the Holy Spirit comes into us. And that is the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. He is the spirit of power. He is the spirit of wisdom. He is the spirit of love. And he comes to dwell within us. And the more we are aware of that, that we have God's spirit within us, the more we will be aware that we have the strength we need to live each day victoriously for God. But the second thing he prays is similar to that. And in some ways, he's saying the same thing twice. But he prays that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. So the spirit living within us, but Christ himself living within us. And of course, the spirit is the spirit of Christ. So he's saying the same thing twice, really. But this is a great mystery of, of the gospel, what Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And in John 15, Jesus promised that this would happen. He said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, I will abide in you. In other words, his life comes to live in us so that we can produce the fruit of the spirit, but so that we have the power to live because it's Christ who's within us. Only Jesus can live the Christian life. And sometimes we have to fail in our own strength to do it in order that we might realize, well, actually, only Christ can live the Christian life. That's why he says in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's a very painful lesson for us to learn. But once we learn it, it opens us up to the secret of the indwelling Christ, that I can be a Christian because Christ lives in me. I can live the Christian life because his spirit is within me. And Paul is praying that we may know and understand this and grasp it. He's praying that we will have the power and the ability that comes with that knowledge. And it may be that today that you are facing very challenging circumstances. It may be that you are being tempted and tempted very strongly and you feel weak to resist that temptation. It may be that you are under trial and, and difficult things are happening you in, in your life and circumstances are against you and you wonder, can I go through this? Can I endure this? Well, the answer is to both is yes. Yes, you can resist temptation. Yes, you can face trials and difficulties. Yes, you can deal with opposition and persecution because you have the life of Christ within you. In his letter, John the Apostle says, 
the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And when the spiritual battle is strong and real and Satan is coming against us, we remind ourselves, I have the light of Christ in me. I have the Holy Spirit dwelling within me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have power to overcome. That's a very strategic way of praying that we will know and understand the spirit in our inner being and Christ living in our hearts. Friends, it means this, that we have to be conscious of the inner life, not just the outer life of activity, of doing things, of going places, making things happen, but the inner life, getting in touch with our spirit, letting God move within us, letting God establish his life inside of us. We have to nurture the inner life. That means taking time to step aside, time to be still, time to be quiet, time to reflect, timing to soak in the very life of God. And then the inner being becomes the source of our outer being. One writer said this, the further the outer journey takes you, the deeper the inner journey must be. And if we want to do many things for God, if we want to do great things for God, that will only be, be possible because we have a deep inner life, because we are growing in our relationship with God and in our knowledge of Jesus Christ. So that's the first thing in this prayer, that we may be empowered. The second thing is that we may be established. And this is what Paul goes on to say in verses 17 and 19. He says this, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. So here is his prayer that we may be established, established in love. And he uses two pictures to illustrate it. The first is a tree, a tree that is rooted in the soil so that when the wind blows, it is not blown over. A tree that can grow tall and strong because its roots go deep into the earth. And that's how it is to be in our relationship with God. We are to be deeply rooted in his love. We are to understand how much he has loved us and how his love surrounds us. And when we are rooted in this knowledge that we are the beloved children of God, then we have strength uh, to withstand the storms of life. He's also saying that we should be rooted or established. That's the word from architecture. It means a building must have a good foundation. The taller the building, the higher the building, the deeper the foundations must be. Otherwise, there's a danger of collapse. If the earth should shake, if there should be a, a tremor, then the, the whole building could come toppling down if it's not built on a good foundation. And so it can be in the Christian life. If we're not deeply rooted in Christ, if we're not established on the firm foundation of God's love for us, and difficulties come, we may shake and even collapse and our faith may fall into pieces. So this is really important. And Paul is praying that we may be rooted and grounded in the love of God. The love of God is the foundation for everything in the Christian life. It's about knowing that God loves me and it's about loving him in return. It's simple, actually. It's to be loved by God and to love him in return. But Paul is praying that we may understand just how great that love is for us. It's not like the love of any human being. It's not like any other kind of love that we may have experienced before. Wonderful though human love might be. It's far, far greater than that. In fact, Paul is really saying here, you cannot measure the love of God. He talks about how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God. Mathematically, that's impossible. You can't have four dimensions. You can only have three at the most. And what Paul is saying is you cannot 
describe in words how great is the love of God. You can't give some mathematical equation that would help you to understand it. Is It is beyond words. It is beyond human contradiction. It is so great. And yet perhaps in those words, if we think about them, we can get some idea of what he's trying to say. He talks about how wide is the love of God. And that means that this is like the widest river or ocean you could ever imagine. And there is room for everybody in the love of God. And it includes everybody and it includes you and it in includes me. I'm reminded of a hymn that says this. There's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. There is plenty for redemption in the blood of Calvary. And because the love of God is so wide, it includes the whole human race. It includes you. It includes me. We are loved by God. But then Paul talks about the length of that love. And by that, he means it goes on forever and ever. It is eternal. It is everlasting. There will never be a time when that love runs out. It will never be exhausted. It is eternal. It is everlasting. And that's why God says in Jeremiah, I have loved you with an everlasting love because it is so long. It's wide and it's long. It goes on forever. But then Paul says it's high. It reaches to the highest heaven because what the love of God does, it takes hold of us, earthbound people, and it lifts us in our spirit up to heaven itself. We are lifted up in knowing God. He takes us from the miry clay and he sets our feet on firm ground. He has caused us to be seated with Jesus in the heavenly places. It lifts us high, high, high. But it also meets us in our deepest, darkest places because this love of God is deep. It comes into the very depths. Even as Jesus came down from heaven to the manger, to the to the uh, to the stable at Bethlehem, to the muck and to the mire. He came seeking and to save us. So the love of God comes to us in our deepest places, our dark places. We're never outside of the love of God. There is no place we can go to, no pit we can fall into where the love of God cannot reach us. No mistake that he cannot forgive. That's the love that God is that, that Paul is talking about, the width, the length, the height, the breadth of it. And what he's saying is, I want you to know that you are held in the center of that love, that you are surrounded by this love, that you are the beloved of God. And nothing, nothing can separate you from that love. In fact, I want to read to you a verse from Romans chapter eight that where Paul uh, kind of explains just how wonderful the love of God is and, 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 and how strong it is and how safe and secure we are in that love. He says this, Romans chapter 8, verse 38, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so Paul's prayer here is that we may be rooted and established, that we may be kind of built on this solid foundation and our roots may go deep into it. And he's praying that, first of all, we may grasp it. May you have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long is the love of God. And that word to grasp means to grasp intellectually to understand with your mind so that your reasoning can be affected by it. Sometimes it's a difficult thing to believe that God can love me in this kind of way. And it's only with the help of the Holy Spirit that our mind can agree with what God says, because we can think of a thousand reasons why God should not love us. We can think of a thousand things we have done that might disqualify us. But God's word is very clear. You are the beloved of God and the Holy Spirit will make that real to you in your mind so that you can grasp it as an objective fact. And in fact, if you doubt it, the Bible says, look at the cross, because there is the objective demonstration 
there God has demonstrated his love for us. But Paul also prays here that we may know this love that surpasses knowledge. And that word to know is to know in experience. It's to know in your heart. So we want it in our minds and we want it in our hearts. In other words, we want to feel it. We want our emotions to be released so that we can know the joy of being loved, so that we can have the peace of feeling secure. That's an emotional response. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit as well, not only to enlighten us, but to shed the love of God abroad in our hearts, to give us the wonderful assurance that makes our hearts leap for joy because we know we are loved by God and we are safe and secure. This is Paul's prayer that we may be established. And my prayer for you today will be that you are standing on a firm foundation. And this foundation is not what you do for God. It's what God has done for you. It's not the list of your achievements, but it's the list of all the goodness that comes to you through his love. You are loved by God and you're surrounded the length, the breadth, the height, the depth of it. You are encircled by this wonderful love of God. That's how you will become strong as a believer. That's how you will endure over weeks and months and years as a disciple. You won't give up. You won't get disheartened. You won't turn back when there's difficulty. Why? Because you know this love. This love is in your heart. And it's how you will be able to love other people. Uh, because having been loved, you can give love to others. Well, that takes us on to the third aspect of this prayer uh, in uh, verse 21, where, where, sorry, verse 19, where Paul says that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. You may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. The measurement that we are using here is not what you as a human being can contain but what God himself can pour into you, <laughs> the measure of the fullness of God. If you have a pint pot, then you can pour a pint of liquid into it. But if you pour more than a pint, it will overflow. And in a sense, you have a certain capacity as a human being to receive love. But God wants to pour his love into you in such a way that it overflows from you and you can be filled to overflowing. You see, the Christian life is a life not of meagre rations, not of small supply, but of generous, bounteous fullness. Fullness is a great New Testament word. We're not meant to live with uh, meagre supplies. We're meant to live out of fullness, the fullness of God. We're meant to be filled with his life. And that's what Paul is praying. I pray that you may know not just a little bit of the love of God, but you may be so filled with the love of God that love overflows from you and you become a loving person. You become loving and joyful and patient and kind and generous and caring and all those kind of things. That happens not because you're trying hard. It happens because you're receiving the love of God. You have a care for the lost because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And when that love, that John 3.16 love enters your heart, you have a care and a compassion for those who are lost as well. And he wants that love to come into you and to flow out through you. But in order to be filled, you have to be emptied. That's another great principle of the Christian life. In order to be filled, you are first to be emptied. Emptied of what? Emptied of pride, empty of sin, empty of stubbornness, empty, empty of self-centeredness, empty of thinking only of your own concerns. We need to be empty friends of all of that so that we can be filled. And sometimes God in his mercy causes us to be empty. If we're becoming proud, he will humble us. If we're becoming stubborn and, and hard-hearted, he will break us. And it's in that emptiness, when we are kind of exhausted of our own resources, in the emptiness, God can come to us in fullness. You see, you cannot live the Christian life by yourself. 
So and sometimes we have to come to an end of ourselves. We have to fail. We, we have to be defeated in order that we can be healed inside and we can be filled afresh and our lives can really count for God. Maybe that's what God is doing in your life right now. Maybe that's why you're going through difficulties. That's maybe why you feel empty. It is so that God can meet you again and he can fill you to overflowing with the love of God. The psalmist said in Psalm 23, my cup overflows. That's the kind of life that God wants for us, a life that is full of joy, a life that is full of peace, a life that is full of love, and it's overflowing from us. We have a fullness. We have to keep coming every day. Every day we need to come and be filled again. And if you keep trying to live the Christian life without being daily filled, soon you will find yourself empty and dry. You have to keep coming every day and say, God, fill me afresh today. That may be what God wants to do with you today. As you listen, as you hear, as you respond, you say, God, I need you to fill me with all that fullness, with all the very fullness of God. So here are three wonderful prayers that the Apostle Paul is praying for you and for me and which we can pray for ourselves, that we may have that strength that comes from knowing the Holy Spirit, the very life of Christ within me in my body that we may be established on this foundation of the love of God, knowing we are safe and secure, nothing can separate us from that love, that we may be every day receiving this fullness into our very being and letting it overflow from us, living a life of, of goodness, living a life of faithfulness, living a life of service. And when that happens, when this is being activated in us, Glory comes into the church. And that's what Paul goes on to pray about in verse 20. He says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. What God wants is a glorious church. And a glorious church is one where every individual is filled with the life of God, is, is living in the good of this prayer, this strategic prayer. And then through the church, God's purpose is always come through the church, through the church, his will and purpose will be done. And, and let me just say this, I, I didn't make a comment on it as we went through it, but verse 18 reminds us that, that it is together with all God's holy people that this can happen. We're not meant to live isolated lives. It's a great temptation nowadays to cut yourself off from other brothers and sisters in Christ. But actually, it's with other people, together with them, that this love can be experienced and can be shared. I need other people to point me to the love of God. And I need to share the love that I have with other people. That's how it works. Don't separate yourself from fellowship make meeting together with others a discipline of your life so that's my heart for you this morning and i want to pray with you as we close and i pray really that god's word would be like a seed which is sown within you and it will bear fruit in days to come father i thank you for the opportunity of thinking together this morning about this wonderful prayer and we make it our own today, Lord. And we say, Lord, would you strengthen us with all that power of God in our inner being so that we can live lives of victory in the face of temptation and trial and opposition and persecution. Father, we pray that the love of God may so take hold of us that we can be rooted and established in that love and know without any shadow of a doubt that we are the beloved of God and that nothing can separate us from that love. And then we pray too, Lord, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God, weak as we are, inadequate as we may be, Lord, you would you fill us with your very life and cause that life to overflow from us. Help us to live good lives, Lord, in the midst of this world. Help us to shine like lights very brightly with your love and your life. Cause our lives to be channels of your blessing, Lord, we pray. 
These things we ask today in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. My friend, Mr. Gok Asain, will be commencing his Revelation and Prophecies Fulfilled study by Zoom on Tuesday, February 7th at p.m. KL time with the repeat on Saturday, February 11th, 3 p.m. KL time. He plans to deliver nine sessions, that is until April 4th and 8th this year. He will go through Revelation chapters, chapters 1 to 3. Each session will be about an hour viewing time on only, followed by time for comments and question and answer. If you're interested, please contact him at 014-251-6466. I repeat, 014-251-6466. We will show you the trailer now. We also want to show you the timetable of the dates and topics. They are as follow for your reference. Now let me say the closing prayer. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for using Pastor Tony Hospital to speak to us. Help us to be rooted and established in love. Help us to be sound in our love. May your spirit continue to work in us so that we can love deeply, sincerely and wholeheartedly. Lord, help us to be able to love our enemies and those who hurt us. Help us to overcome evil with good, to bless them and to do them good. Lord, you have said that all men will know that we are your disciples if we have love for one another. Lord, may we present an effective witness to the world. May your love, peace and joy always be in our hearts. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.